Have you been to Calvary? That's the most important place you'll ever go in this world. No question about it. Amen. All right. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn with me tonight to the book of John, chapter number 12, and verse number 32. John, the beloved apostle. John chapter 12 and verse number 32. The Lord Jesus said, And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Father, bless this holy book tonight. Lord, give me the strength I need now to preach it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated, folks. Go ahead and be seated. This is lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ. I made mention of this a number of times this morning, how that the churches today are preaching prosperity. They're, they're, preaching, they're preaching churchianity. They're preaching religion. They're preaching about you. They're preaching about me. They're preaching about men. And they've got everything in the world on their mind except the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we should be about, folks. That's what we should all be about. I heard someone say one time, well, now I'll tell you what, you can preach too much on Christ. They're just, I mean, you just, there's other things that are important. No, 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 no. You can sing too much. You can talk too much. You can preach too much. You'll never pray too much. And you'll never exhaust the Lord Jesus Christ preaching about him. Amen, amen. So he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. So let's lift him up a little bit tonight. Turn to Mark chapter number 6 and verse number 3. Mark chapter 6 and verse number 3. The scripture says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And he told them plainly, A prophet is not without honor, verse 4, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. This is one of the worst things that smites our faith, and that is familiarity, familiarity with holy things. You'd be surprised how many people tonight that would give their, give their anything to be able to come to a church like this and hear the word of God as it is preached. I can imagine what's going to happen in Afghanistan. Now, the Taliban has already taken Kabul, and that's the capital city, about six million people. And you know how vicious these people are? And there's some of the old videos show them stoning people to death. And this is, this is Afghanistan. And there's a few Christians over there. But they don't have the liberty we have. They don't have the liberty we have. We ought to thank God for freedom. Amen. The old old timer said, you don't know, you miss, you'll never miss you well until your water runs dry. And that's what's happening, I'm afraid, for an awful lot. Matthew chapter number 13 and verse number 55 says this. Matthew 13, verse 55. It says this, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. They couldn't accept what he had to say because he was not a product of their schools. They couldn't accept what he had to say because he was not a product of their approval. He had no accolades laid upon him, no stars, no crowns, no, no titles given to him from man. He didn't need them. He was anointed of God to preach his word. This is the carpenter's son. In the book of Matthew chapter number 2 and verse number 3, 20, 23, Matthew 2, 23, it says this, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, he should be called a Nazarene. He came to the wrong side of the tracks. Nathaniel says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Obviously, that's a rhetorical question. The answer's in the question. No, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. Oh, yes, it did. The Lord Jesus Christ came. The scripture said he made his grave with the wicked. When the Son of Man came to this world, he came to mankind, born in a manger. He came to the lowest, the sickest, the weakest, those that were the castaways, those that men had nothing to do with. And the Bible says in the book of John, that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination to God. God doesn't see the way we see. 
He looks at a human being and he looks into their soul. You may see value in what they can do for you, but God doesn't. You may see value in them what they can give you, but God doesn't. You may see value in them because they're pretty or handsome or something like that. God doesn't. He looks upon the human heart and he tells that heart, I love you and I died for you. And it makes no difference where you came from or who you are. In John chapter number 8 and verse number 48, we read these words. John 8, 48. This eighth chapter, the gospel of John. It's one of the most confrontational chapters in the whole New Testament. I mean, they pulled no punches. He told them in verse number 48, in John chapter number 8 and verse number 48, they said, answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? See this? They said he was a Samaritan, a half-breed Jew. You know where they came from, 722 B.C. The Assyrians carried them captivity. They didn't take all the people. The Bible said they left the lowest of the land, the weakest, those that didn't have anything. They left them in the land. And it's a good thing you think about the fact that you leave somebody in the land because if you don't, the wild animals will overrun it in no time. So in order to keep something for them to come back to, that's what they did. But they intermarried with them. And when they did, the Samaritan was born. He's a half-breed Jew. And, of course, he was hated by these blue blood Jews down there in Jerusalem. You know what a blue blood is? A blue blood refers back to royalty in Europe. And the, royalist, the royalty in Europe, they didn't get out in the sun like, uh, like the worker in the field. They didn't get out in the sun. So their skin had a white hue to it. White, because there's no suntan. And yet when the blood coursed through their veins, it looked blue through that white skin. And so the term blue blood was born. And, of course, it was a moniker for that one who is privileged, highly privileged, and comes down to us this day. If you refer to a bunch of blue bloods, you're talking about somebody that lives on the other side of the tracks from you. Amen. He's got more money than you have, more prestige, more power, loved by the world. Aren't you glad you don't love the world? Amen. Love not the world, anything of the world. Love of the Father's not in him. Amen. In John chapter number 8 and verse number 48, here's what they said of him, though. They said, Sayest we not well, thou art a Samaritan, and hast a devil? Boy, here you are demon-possessed, they said of him. But did you know what the demon said? They said, We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. The devil said that. Did you know what? I agree with them. Amen. amen. If I'd have been there, I'd have said, Amen, devil. That's the truth. <laughs> did you know that that devil preached more truth than most of the pulpits in this country? You realize a demon over there in the New Testament had the, that's the truth, folks. He's the Holy One of God. But you see, they're spirits, and they're from the spirit world, and they don't have to worry with what you do. They know what it's like there. And so they said he was demon-possessed. John chapter number 8 and verse number 41. Remember, this is a confrontational chapter. John chapter number 8 and verse number 41. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We got one father, even God. In plain words, you're the son of Mary. You're not the son of Joseph and Mary. You're the son of Mary. That's the idea. And when you get into Babylonian Talmud and it says Ben Pantera, the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to by Ben Pantera, Pandera rather, either one of the two. And what simply means is he's the son of ba Pandera or Pantera, which is a Roman soldier. So that was the word that was passed among the Jews of his day, that he's illegitimate. They said, we be not born of fornication. Caiaphas was one of his greatest enemies. Caiaphas hated the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he came to turn upside down the, religious, the religion and politics of his country. He came to point them to God. And he came as a light to lighten the Gentiles and the truth of God to go unto them who sat in darkness. The Bible says they saw a great light. And Caiaphas hated him. He was the high priest of Israel at the time. He despised the Lord Jesus. Why? Because of the Old Testament? Because of the Bible? No. Because of his oral tradition and because of the Mishnah, which is a, if you got into the Talmud, if you had a copy of it in your hand tonight, a part of it, you have the Gemara, you've got the Mishnah, you've got the, the other parts of the, of the, of the Talmud, and the, and the Mishnah is a commentary on the oral law. And when they said these people knowing not the law are cursed, 
They weren't talking about the fact they didn't know the Old Testament written scriptures. They were talking about the fact that they weren't the elite blue bloods who had the oral law given to them. Because according to them, the oral law preceded and trumped the written law. But the Lord Jesus said to the two on the road to Emmaus, when he opened the scriptures and they said our hearts burned within us, he says to the Jews, he said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. What scriptures are we talking about, preacher? We're talking about Genesis through Malachi. During the lifetime of our Lord Jesus Christ, that was the Bible. Genesis through Malachi. No New Testament scriptures were written in 30-something A.D. when he died. And so Caiaphas despised him. But did you know what? They found an ossuary. I told you about this the other day. A bone box down there in what's called Gehenna, the area of Valley of Hinnom, uh, close to the city of David on the slopes that come down from Mount Moriah. And they went back in a cave, and I think some, I think some, some Arabs had moved into a cave and had made that their home. And one of the kids just kind of, you know how kids are, in discovery, went on back into the cave and found an ossuary in there. That thing was 2,000 years old. And it said Caiaphas, son of Joseph. And now the scholars say today, oh, that's not the Caiaphas of the New Testament. Not? Well, what do you base that on? Caiaphas, son of Joseph. And no doubt in my mind, because it was ornate. It had beautiful carvings in the side of it. No question about the fact that the bones in that thing were expensive. The person was, was valuable. Was, the person had money. He had prestige. He had all of that. And so it wasn't just a simple bone box. That's what an ossuary is. It was beautiful. It had symmetrical drawing and symmetrical uh, uh, carvings in the side of it. And that's where Caiaphas, son of Joseph, wound up. Mark chapter number 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 61. We read these words tonight. Mark 14, 61. That'd help if I get in the right book. Here we are. Mark 14, 61. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ? the Son of the Blessed. Now look at verse 62. And Jesus said, I am. Amen. I heard a fellow who started a television, Christian television network all over the country. I heard him. I was sitting there listening to him. And I heard him say across the TV screens, nowhere in the New Testament did Jesus ever claim to be the Son of God. I thought, oh, Lord, have mercy, man. It's one thing to be ignorant. It's quite another one to stick your head up and let everybody see it. <laughs> That's as plain as it can be. I am. <laughs> and he ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That's just this ego I me. That's a Greek. It's two Greek words you wouldn't know unless you'd. I've given it to you before. It is an emphatic emphasized ego this is where we get the english word ego ego has to do with your personality it has to do with your soul it has to do with what kind of person you are your ego are you a maniac where you want to run over people and you want to climb to the top no matter who you kill or cut their throat that's your ego that's your ego at work and i me is that greek word that emphasizes it ego i me in other words it's translated in english i am and the Gospel of John has, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. And I love the one where he said to them, before Abraham was, I am. I am. <laughs> Some woman came along and said, that's bad grammar. It's good theology. <laughs> I am that I am. That's what he said to Moses, didn't he? What should I call them? What am I going to tell the children of Israel? When I go, see you tell them, I am hath sent you. They understood that. They understood the self-existing, absolute, eternal one. That's what they understood that to me. Matthew chapter number 26, he rent his clothes. So Caiaphas was the pushing power. He was the one who was, he was pushing everything to get Christ crucified. They want to do away with this man. Get rid of him. And they did everything they could. And so I talked to you in the Talmud. Jesus is mentioned a number of times. He's called Yeshu. 
Y-E-S-H-U. Now, this is not Yeshua. This is Yeshu. You say, well, isn't that another form of Jesus? No. The word Yeshu means let his name be blotted out from the face of the earth. And Yeshu shows up in the Babylonian Talmud over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. It's all through it. All through it. Don't you think it's a sad thing when these poor old stupid people that lift up their head and tell you that Christ never lived? You're talking to a dumb bunny. Amen. Amen. As they say in Berlin, Dunkoff. <laughs> so sad. You can educate ignorant, but what are you going to do with stupid? <laughs> it's pretty bad. <laughs> yes, shoo. They say in the Talmud that the Lord Jesus is boiling in excrement in hell. The Talmud is what blinds their eyes to Christ, folks. The Talmud, the Talmud, blind, not the Bible, not the Bible. You remember I told you from Isaiah 53 this morning. In Isaiah 42, the servant of the Lord. There's no question in my mind. The servant of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. No question. And yet they'll run to Isaiah, 50, uh, Isaiah 42 and they'll say, the servant of the Lord is Israel. No, it's not Israel. In Mark chapter number 1 and verse number 24, Mark 1, 24. Here you can read it right in the scripture. Mark 1, 24. There was a synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. You ought to get up and preach a message sometimes. We're going to let demons preach this message about Christ. Amen. And they, they could. Do you remember the book of Acts when that, spirit, that young woman had the spirit of Python? Python's the snake in, in ancient Greek. It, uh, Ophis is what they called it. Ophiolo Ophiolatry. They worshiped the snake. The snake. The serpent. They worshiped it. And so she had the spirit of Python. The spirit of the serpent. And here's what she said. These be the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. Was that true? Yes. Absolutely true. No question about it. So why did the apostle rebuke her? He rebuked her because he did not want that truth to come from that source. That's why. Because that would be identifying with her and give her legitimacy and God would have no part in it. Amen. This is why he's committed to us. Preachers, the church, apostles, evangelists. The preaching of the word of the living God. And that's what he did. And he started with the apostles. They came, became the foundation of the church and only went in the book of Ephesians. I'm not an apostle. I'm a preacher. I'm a bishop. And that's what I am in the body of Christ. The Bible to tells us in John chapter number 20 and verse 28. I love this one. I love John 20, 28. Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. He never did touch that nail print in his hand. He never touched that spear thrust in his side. He didn't have to touch it. All he had to see. Thomas, you believe because you've seen. And I don't question the fact that you believe, Thomas, no question, none whatsoever. But you believe because you've seen. Blessed are they that believe and have not seen. That's you and me. Amen. And I believe. No question in my mind. Did you know that Thomas is one of the most common names among men? I've never met one named Judas, but I've met a bunch of them named Thomas. I've never met a woman named Jezebel, have you? <laughs> I'm sure some have been called that when they get in a dog fight with each other. But I've never met a, uh, met a woman named Jezebel, and I've never met a man named Judas. But I've met a bunch of Thomases. Do you know why? Because there's something about Thomas that people identify with. Thomas was genuine and Thomas was real, but he was doubting Thomas. This is where we get this. Have you ever had a, have you ever had a crisis of your faith? Have you ever come to a time in your life where you, where you wasn't, where's God? What am I supposed to do now? You know, the promises of God. But where are the promises of God? What's the reality of living in this world? And that comes to us. Folks, it comes to all of us. It comes to every one of us. Don't let anybody flim-flam you and walk around like they're on a cloud and there's some great champion of faith that nobody else is. No, we all are. We all live in this world. And Thomas said, you're my Lord and you're my God. And we all do that. We'll go through our little problems 
And during that time, get to stop talking to somebody the other day and said, said, please pray for this person. They're mad at God. They're mad at God. You know what? I didn't get mad at them. And I tried, I didn't, I, I didn't try to do anything to add to their problems or their sorrow. No, sir. They're mad at God, they said. Well, you know something? That's okay. At least they believe there's a God. Amen. They're mad at him. They won't stay mad at him. Time heals wounds. And they'll find out that he was always with them by their side regardless of what happened. He's still the good Lord. He never fails us. He never fails us. Thomas, my Lord and my God. Peter, the Lord Jesus didn't rebuke him. He agreed with what he said. Here's what Peter said in Matthew 16. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? Matthew 16, 14. They said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, so one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We got, we got religious worship houses all over America. We got religious worship houses out here with beautiful stained glass, no question about beautiful stuff, and, uh, and, and crosses and, 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 uh, and uh, what we call them, naves and all these other terms uh, that, uh, for the churches. But Christ is not in them. He's nowhere to be found. Nowhere. You know, let me tell you something. The only people on this earth who really know who Jesus Christ is is his body, his bride. We're the only ones who really know who he is. He's God Almighty manifest in the flesh. He said in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, All things delivered to me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. You see this? This is a reciprocal indwelling of an understanding of who God is. That's what we know now. We know who he is. One of these days, if he allows us, we'll know what he is when we see that spirit being in all of his glory. Amen. And it'll only be as much as he reveals to us. And I have a feeling that no creature could take in all that he is. And I don't believe it. I don't, I don't have a feeling they can't. And you could be with him for a million years, a million times a million years, and still be blown away by his glory. His glory. Amen. You'll never get. <laughs> if all you had in heaven was a city of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, streets of pure transparent gold, for a while you'd be jumping up and down and walking on cloud nine. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Come over and see my mansion where I live. Look at this. Isn't this wonderful? And that's all some people think heaven is. Folks, that's just a place. Heaven's not a place. Heaven's a person. Amen. Amen. John said we do not yet know what we shall be, but we know when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Even to this day, the Lord Jesus at the right hand of the Father is still not completely manifested to us as how he is. What, what's his essence at the right hand of the Father? Don't know, but I do know this. I know he's there, and thank God he's praying for me. Did you know the Muslims know that Christ was here? They know he's a prophet. The Muslims say he was, he was, his mother was Mary. As many of the Muslims teach that Christ is a Messiah. Many of the Muslims teach that he, uh, that he was a great uh, prophet, a great healer, performed miracles. And they teach all of this, but they deny the cross. They refuse completely to believe that Christ died on the cross. They absolutely reject the idea that the Lord Jesus Christ is God's Son. To the Muslim, God is one God. He has no son. And so therefore they can exalt Christ in a lot of ways. A lot of ways. Even when you get into their eschatology. Many of the Muslims are teaching that the Mahdi is going to come back. He's the Islamic uh, savior, redeemer. And that when he comes back, Issa is what they call him in Islam. Issa. Issa is going to be his helpmate, his helpmate. And they're going to set about to change the world. And Issa is going to destroy the cross. And he's going to tell people that he was wrong when he was here 2,000 years ago. And that he's a Muslim now. 
And Issa, their Jesus, wants you to become a Muslim. Let them teach that. Now think about that. There's a man who wrote an article called The Islamic Antichrist. There's a lot in it that would make you believe that the Antichrist could very well come from Muhammad and from Islam. Now, you're his bride and you're his body. Who is he to you? He is certainly not Issa. His name is Jesus. Or you can say it in Greek, Yesu. Or you can say it in Hebrew, Yahashua. But he is our savior, our salvation. Folks, you have a constitution in the United States of America. All right, this constitution. All right, you've got three branches of government. You've got a legislative, you've got an executive, and you've got a what? You've got that judicial, all right? You've got those justices sitting on that, uh, on that bench. It is their job to interpret that constitution. That's their job to interpret it because that is the law of the land. The legislative branch is where you have a house and about 500 members and every two years you vote on them. So it's called the house of the people. Then you have a Senate and the senator's term is about six years. Six years they serve out their term. Not about it is. Six years. All right. Now that has to do with government. It has to do with law. It has to do with republic. It has to do with the constitution of, the, of this country, what you live under. So if I have a question about that, I'm not going to the church. I'm not going to look up a preacher. I'm going to go to a senator or I'm going to go to a justice on that court. I'm going to go to somebody who understands the law of the land. But neither will I let them come in here and tell me who Jesus is. I step out of bounds when I try to tell them what, how to run their business, and they step out of bounds when they come into the church of God and tell us, try to run ours, amen. This is what Jefferson's talking about, a separation. They've blown it all out of proportion, perverted it, of church and state. I don't want Caesar telling the church what our constitution is, what makes us what we are, and what we should believe. Caesar has no hands off. You've got no business trying to tell the church what it should believe or even who Christ is. So this is what the Muslim teaches. The Hindu says that Jesus came. Don't question about it. It's just too much for, to deny it. He came, and it's all about his message. The Hindu's all about his message of love. That if we don't understand that this message of love and about self-actualization and the Godhead that's within us, that's where Hinduism, that's where the New Age movement comes from. That's where Helena Blavatsky and Theosophy, it all comes from a common root. And that common root is sin's not your problem. No, no, no. Your problem is not sin. Your problem is simply understanding you're God. And you find God within you. And that's the teaching and the doctrine of Hinduism. Isn't that sad? Have you ever noticed how that the faith of Christ and church of God is the only place on this earth that knows how to deal with sin? It is. It's the only place. It's the only place. Why, preacher? Because we have the only answer. The answer for sin is a person. The answer for salvation is a person. The answer for everything you need is a person. Amen. And I can't emphasize that too much tonight. We, the church of the living God, we know who he is. And it's our job to let people know that. The Lord Jesus is in every book of the Bible. Now close out with us tonight. In the book of Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In the book of Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In the book of Leviticus, he's the high priest. Our high priest transcends the priesthood of Aaron and goes all the way to Melchizedek, Hebrews chapter 7. In the book of Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. He protects us and guides us. And then in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means, means the second giving namas of the law. Deuteronomos is what the word is. The second giving of the law, he's the prophet like unto Moses. In the book of Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Ruth, blue, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful picture of one of the great things in the Old Testament. He's our kinsman redeemer. 
kinsman redeemer. In the Psalms, he's our shepherd. Isaiah, he's called the Prince of Peace. Jeremiah, the righteous branch. And I brought you a message the other night about the branch. Now, you remember what I read to you this morning where he shall grow up? You remember I prayed you that uh, as, as, a, as a little shoot out of a dry ground? All right, if you'll just, I'm not going to do it tonight, but take a little time and, and, and research into that, and you'll be amazed at how it shows you how the, the Davidic kingdom will prosper from generation to generation, and Christ will sit on the throne of his father David, and nothing is going to stop that, even if Caesar tries to, or if, if, uh, if uh, uh, like the madman over there 2,000 years ago, Herod, when he had all the kids from two years old under put to death, the pogroms throughout the Old Testament, look at the book of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, Esther, that book is all about a pogrom to try to do away with the Jewish people. And Satan tried to destroy them many times. And that's quite a study on its own. Then in Daniel, he's the Ancient of Days. Malachi is the Son of Righteousness with healing in his wings. Then in Matthew, he's the King. Mark, he's the Servant. Luke, he's the Man. Traces his genealogy all the way back to God. He's the man of men. He's a pure man all the way to Adam. Then in the Gospel of John, he's that eagle that soars because he's the son of God. Joseph is a type of Christ. Did you know that in the Old Testament? Joseph is a type of Christ. And here's what it says about Joseph. I don't have the scripture referenced, but it's in the book of Genesis along about chapter number 48 or 49 where Jacob said, Joseph, you are a fruitful bough. A fruitful bough. You will bring forth fruit. Now I look at you tonight. You're sitting in this auditorium. And here you are. Now why'd you come? For the movie? <laughs> popcorn? We don't have any popcorn. I like popcorn just as much as the next man. That's not why we're here. No movie, no popcorn. What are we doing here, preacher? No bingo. No dance. We're not dancing. You're going to have a big band in. No, no bands. So what do we do here tonight? We came in here because of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we did. That's the only thing that can keep me going in this world is the Son of God. Amen. Father, bless your word tonight. Bless it the hearing of the people. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, have you been faithful? Thank you for that. In thy name I pray. Now, I want to mention this to you because I read about this this past week. And you might need to hear this tonight. And you may be watching this thing live streaming and you may need to hear it. Or hear it later. This woman was a daughter of a well-known evangelist. She was his daughter. Mm -hmm. And she was doing some missionary work here in America. And they came to her and said, would you please visit the prison? I think that prison was in Florida. She said, will you come and visit in this prison? At first she hesitated. God told her, you go. When she got to the prison, they took her to death row. Death row. Death row. So she went from cell to cell and talked to the prisoners. She came to one cell. There was a young man in there, 25, 30 years old. And he had such joy on his face. His face was shining and gleaming. She was so encouraged by just talking to him. What a wonderful thing. But he's on death row. He's going to be executed. But she said, there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. He knew my Lord Jesus Christ. He loved the Lord. It wasn't long after her trip to death row that she got a phone call. And she got a phone call. A person called her and said, now, I want you to know something. I appreciate what you did because we prayed for him. But the one you saw on death row murdered my son brutally murdered him brutally and now he is a Christian it's when she said that to her she said she looked down in her soul and said you know what that's the grace of God that's what every last one of us have before us if we're willing to accept it tonight you may not be a murderer you may not be an adulterer, you may not be a thief, a liar, but you are a fallen creature. Romans 5 says plainly, 
we have fallen. We inherit from Adam a fallen nature, Romans 5. We've inherited it from him. And the only one that can change that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, you mean he goes on death row? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He can go where you can't go. He can go where you can't go. This murderer will pay for it with his life, but he'll be saved when he goes. And there'll be a lot of religious people that are good, upstanding, self-righteous, holier-than-thou religious people, folks. Never murdered anybody, and they'll go to hell. And that murderer goes to heaven. That's the grace of God. Amen. What have we got, brother? Page 17, the All-American Church Hymnal, Have Thine Own Way. Mm -hmm. 